thank you very much for getting up so early. I'm sure it will be very well worth you coming this morning. This is our gala Christmas breakfast, of course, our number one business forum, business function of the year. It's going to be a great morning. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very proud to be standing here before you as chairman of my last meeting as president. The Brisbane Virginia Chamber of Commerce is honoured that so many of Brisbane's business people are here with in attendance to welcome our special guest speaker, Dr. John Houston. I think just one more round of applause for Dr. Houston. I think he's great. I'd like to thank those sponsors that Keith was speaking about earlier. Thank you very much. We're all business people and we know how important it is to have sponsorship for a business organisation like ourselves. We wouldn't exist without the generous, and I do say the very generous sponsorship that we receive. So I'd like to thank them very, very much. Now also, I know most of the people here, which is great. There's many of our members here, many of our regulars, and that's wonderful. There's also some people here who are here for the first time, some prospective members, and of course some special guests. So please, at your tables, make sure that you meet everybody in true Junior Chamber of Commerce style. Introduce yourselves, make the people who are here for the first time feel very welcome, and um, I'm sure we'll see them in the very near future as a result. So breakfast is about to be served. I'm not going to hold that up. I know we're all rather hungry, and um, I'm sure our guest speaker will be with us very shortly to speak. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and um, have a good breakfast.
sorry that I'm afflicted with this, uh, or what politicians would call a disease, the loss of voice. It's a great opportunity, I'm sure, for the electorate to have a quiet Christmas. So um, I'll be brief in my remarks. I gather the main purpose of this morning is for you to ask me questions. Um, but I'm very pleased to be here on this your Christmas, uh, on the occasion of your Christmas function, and to see so many of you looking so good so early in the morning. I'm lying, some of you don't look particularly well at all. <laughs> but I'm very pleased to be here. And for me, I, I think I'm having breakfast with the future of Australia. Young people, and young business people in particular, are where it's all going to happen in the course of the next uh, 30 or 40 years. And I think many in this room are uniquely placed to benefit in that, to play a part of that, and of course to benefit from that. You mentioned that I had had a mixed career of being an academic, and being in the commercial world and dabbling in politics. Well, two out of three uh, decisions being sensible. This is not a bad outcome for my life. You can choose which one that was an exciting uh, diversion. But I'm often asked why I went into politics. And um, I often wonder why. Now, I honestly uh, felt very strongly in the middle 1980s that this country was headed in the wrong direction. And it was easy to sit outside and criticise. I used to write a weekly column in the Business Review Weekly, and I found myself very critical of both sides of government. Um, at the time, I was both a professor at the university and the executive director of the Quarry Bank, and uh, I had a pretty good life and a good, pretty good range of opportunities. So it came home very clearly to me that we get few occasions in our life we can actually, where we can actually do a bit more where we can actually try and make a contribution. And having been an economist by training and active in the business community, I felt very strongly that uh, Australia really was losing a lot of opportunities. I have spent uh, in my working life an enormous amount of time in Asia, in the Asian Pacific region. And I was particularly conscious of how we were falling behind the major performers in our region. And the more we fall behind, the more restricted our range of opportunities in Australia will be. And in the end, of course, the less our standard of living will improve. And so it was against that background that I thought uh, it was possible in politics to make change, to make significant change, and that one way or another, Australia would have to find its place in the Asian Pacific region. And we've been doing that for quite some time. It wasn't something that was discovered by Paul Keating a couple of years ago. It was, in fact, a trend in Australian politics in the whole post-war period. And I think it's interesting to look back at some of the early moves under the Menzies governments of the 50s and 60s and how they were sustained by governments of both persuasions after that in gradually integrating our country with the region. For example, in the 1950s, the Menzies government negotiated the first trade agreement with Japan. Now that was a very difficult thing to do in the aftermath of the Second World War, where the electorate didn't want to have very much to do with Japan at all. And there was also then a very important turning point when Britain decided to link with Europe and move into the common market, and Australia decided to go, to go on its own. It was an interesting contrast. New Zealand went with Britain and we didn't. The adjustments that were made saw Australia find an even greater place in the region. We had things like the, uh, the Colombo Plan, which brought uh, thousands of Asians to study in Australia. And we thought the Southeast Asian Treaty Organisation, which was initiated and sponsored by Australia, a whole host of steps were taken in those early years to lay the base. Today, of course, if you listen to the Prime Minister, Australia is really a booming success story in Asia quotes endlessly statistics about how our export performance to the region has increased so dramatically in recent years. And it's true that uh, in the last 15 or 17 years, exports from Australia to the Asian region have gone up by about 12% a year. And that is a phenomenal figure. But um, if you look at their import demand over that period, it's gone up three times out of 36% a year. So not surprising that we've lost market share. Although we've done better than a lot of people expected we could do, we've fallen way short of the mark in terms of where we could have been if we actually put some of the correct policies in place. When I was uh, a student uh, 
to the university in the 1960s, small island countries like Singapore and Taiwan, Hong Kong, were not countries that we saw as economic or political or social success stories. Even Japan was not looked at in the 60s as a, as a major success. Sure, it was growing very fast and restructuring after the war. But in Australia in 1970, our standard of living was still significantly higher than that of Japan. In fact, the Japanese standard of living was only two thirds of ours in 1970. But by 1980, it was equal to ours. And by 1990, our standard of living was two thirds of theirs. In countries like Singapore and Hong Kong, have seen their standard of living come from nowhere to now surpass ours in the space of 20 to 25 years. So while our future is in the region, and while it will be the fastest growing region in the world for the next 30 or 40 years at the least, there's no way we're going to be a success in that region simply because we're close to it. Geographical proximity is not enough to get us across the line. <coughs> And so I think we now have in Australia not only an opportunity to be part of that region, but I think a responsibility to actually make sure that we don't waste that opportunity. And that is really what motivated me in politics, to actually make sure, and so insofar as I could, that the debate focused on the issues <coughs> that are important to Australia, that, uh, that some of the difficult issues are raised, some of the difficult debates take place, Hopefully, in the end, some sensible policy comes out, comes out the back. Well, I didn't do too well the last question. We lost that one because I told the truth. But um, I still believe that we've raised the profile of debate in this country to a level that has never been to before. I still believe that uh, um, issues have been raised that would not otherwise have been raised, and policy directions have been set, uh, even though the policies themselves haven't yet been embraced, many of them will be, and many of them will have to be, if this country is to make its mark in the region. As I say, being here at the Junior Chamber of Commerce, I am with what I consider to be the future of Australia, both young people and business people. But I despair, having come from a business background, to look at politics and to see how many in politics do not understand business do not understand what has got to be done for business to actually get on and do the job, to let business get on and do the job. I mean, people who <clears throat> develop the type of uh, fringe benefits tax structure we have, or the capital gains tax structure we have, or the personal or corporate tax structure we have, or the superannuation tax structure we have, let alone to those who develop the industrial relations system we've got, or the waterfront or the transport or electricity generation systems we've got really don't understand business. The same pose massive costs and inefficiencies and, and <coughs> regulations and restrictions on business. In recent days, since I lost the leadership, I've spent a bit of time starting and developing businesses in the region myself. And apart from the policies that I see here holding back business, and many of those were identified and addressed at the time of the last election, I find an attitude problem in Australia that is very significant. You try and deal with a government department as a business person to get your business up and underway in Australia, and then go and try that in Singapore or Hong Kong or somewhere else in the region, and you will be shattered by the difference. In Canberra, you will be fogged off from one place to the next, and be left pretty much uh, wondering why you even bothered. In fact, you need to set the business up quite often, you still wonder why you didn't bother. In Asia, they tend to open the doors and they tend to make it, they tend to encourage you to be there. One I was working on was in Singapore, I went to the Economic Development Board. They uh, said, you know, what do you want to do? I explained the nature of the business. Well, can we help you? Never hear that here. <laughs> Put you in touch with other government departments, uh, link you up with the key people. Of course, you'll have to have some sort of tax structure that encourages you to be here. Uh, you have to train your staff that can help you with that. The research and development expenditure you've got to make, well, we can help you with that too, and so on and so forth. In fact, every time we have trouble developing that business, we bring up the Economic Development Board and opening somebody in the problem solved. That attitude problem in Australia is so real. 
people not only in business and government don't understand business, not only politicians in government don't understand business, but they really have an attitude problem towards business. Yet ironically, if we don't get business growing and developing, this country has not much of a future. Whether we like it or not, everything we want to do in Australia spins off the back of business. If business isn't successful, then wealth is not going to be generated. If you don't have the wealth, you can't really keep redistributing it. And this government for 12 or 13 years has been redistributing it. It's about time they focused on developing something. Because you can't keep redistributing a smaller and smaller pie. You are going to have to at some stage focus on how you increase the size of the pie. So I, I've uh, enjoyed my opportunity so far in politics to be part of a process that tries to raise the standard of debate and change some of those attitudes towards wealth generation as well as wealth redistribution. There's just one quote that I'd like to share with you to finish my remarks, which is a statement by Theodore Roosevelt, which I think summarises my attitude not only to business or to politics, but to life. And I think it's probably a good basis on which to um, advise this chamber on the attitude it should take in this uh, political and business debate. And the quote goes as follows. The credit in life goes not to the critic who stands on the sideline and points out where the strong stump is, but rather the real credit in life goes to the person who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by sweat and dust, who knows great enthusiasm and great devotion and lives to spend himself in a worthy cause. If he wins, he knows the thrill of great achievement, and if he loses, at least he loses while daring greatly so that his place in life will never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. I think you should think about that. Thank you. I'd like to take the opportunity to ask uh, Dr John a few uh, questions. And, um, I spent all this time preparing these questions and faxing it through to his office only to find out this morning that uh, only to find out this morning that he had a good reason. So uh, <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> and Matthew Bramley for persevering and asking me to do this. John, in your opinion, where do you believe the business opportunities in the next ten years will be in Australia? Well obviously anything that's linked to the region is the is the direction to go or anything that spins off the region. That's a general point. I don't think we really understand as much as we should the nature of the growth that will be there and the direction in which it will go, but as a general comment, uh, developing the export potential into the Asia Pacific region is, is, a, is a major opportunity. Where can that be? Well, it's always dangerous for a politician to try and pick winners, but you could realistically say there will be opportunities right across the board. But um, there are clearly going to be some areas in which we won't compete, we won't compete very well, excuse me, either here or in the region. Anything that's uh, mass produced with a large labour content is going to be difficult for us to compete. But it doesn't mean that we can be out of some of those industries. For example, if we try to make uh, basic men's or women's underwear and compete with the Chinese, we have a problem. They'll always make it cheaper and, uh, and market it easier than we will. But if we add a design like uh, Elman first and underwear, then uh, we will have we'll have an edge, a competitive edge. And uh, that competitive edge will allow us to carve out a niche. So we won't be able to sell the basic product which is mass produced. But something that's not mass produced, more of a boutique or niche market, uh, with a bit of brain in it, a bit of brain based uh, design and so on, you know, We'll go out to succeed. If we apply those sort of rules across the board, you'd be sure to sell more for us. I think one area would be, for example, food processing. Uh, the demand for food as the standard living of the region grows and the change in tastes in the region, which will take place in, very, in the next 15 or 20 years, uh, is recognised. Processed food is going to be a phenomenal one. Anything in information and technology, of course, is, is a major opportunity to medium. That's why I've been spending a bit of time in recent days. I mean, everyone's cabling up and putting up satellites and you know, 
rapid pace of development of the PC and all sorts of new platforms that are about to be released and for interactive uh, uh, services, there's a phenomenal market there. And I think Australia's niche is in brain-based, again, software capabilities. I uh, know he's trying to compete in hardware, but certainly in software, uh, we, have an, we have an edge. Uh, in certain systems and management in that area, we have an edge. Um, and of course, anywhere in services, I think, finally, we have opportunities. Tourism, we haven't scratched, we haven't scratched the surface of what we can do in terms of the region. Education, we've done a lot in recent years, but so much more that could be done. Medical services, we have uh, by far, we are by far among the best in the world in medical services and medical research. Um, I'm fascinated at how many people from the Asia Pacific region go to the United States and the United Kingdom for heart surgery or collective surgery. Australia could, in fact, do that on a very large scale. And uh, that is a very big export industry. Construction, and design, architecture, and consulting services, legal, accounting services, all possibilities. And finally, might I say, even financial services. I still think Australia could have. Uh, probably the second most important financial centre after Tokyo in the region, if we were prepared to make some decisions, abolish a few taxes, stamp duties and financial institutions duties, set up a, separate, a serious stock market, <coughs> I'll get some flack for that, but people in Australia still see the stock market as somewhere where you have a punt, and I actually think it's a place where in fact business has to raise its equity. And as soon as we change that attitude and build it properly, we will change a lot of the opportunities for business in Australia. An effective second board, for example, would be a way that uh, the people could access equity where they can't today. So I've just given you a few areas, but I think they are, they are real possibilities there. But our emphasis is not on mass-produced, low-cost, um, high-labor content products, but more brain-based, uh, technology-based, uh, where we have a competitive edge. John, leading on from that, and uh, you say that uh, in the room here is um, is the future of the country in regards to uh, business people. Our age group is um, anywhere from 20 to 40 uh, as an organisation. To take up those opportunities that you just spoke about there, what sort of attitude, characteristic skills uh, do we need to have as, as those future leaders of business? Well, I think that Australia is uh, well endowed with people that have them already. We have a very good education system. You can always say it can be better, and we do. We point out how to improve it. But we've produced a lot of very good people uh, over the years who are sufficiently well trained to be able to take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, we've also um, had a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit in Australia, which uh, has sometimes been to a disadvantage, but uh, there is that spirit there. And we should never lose that. We should find ways of nurturing it and developing it. We've had a couple of notable um, <laughs> failures, should I say, in recent days. The international community has focused on some of our high flyers who have not performed. But there are so many good people with similar entrepreneurial skills who are out there <coughs> pursuing their interests, which uh, need to be encouraged. I think a lot of what government should do is just get out of the way. And I don't think government really should try and develop that. It's there, it's in our, it's in eight, I think, in the Australian character in many ways. And sort of the rogue element, the bush ranger element, is somewhere in each of us, does uh, sort of underwrite that entrepreneurial spirit. My greatest fear is that government tends to come over the top of it and, uh, and discourage it. It's so much harder to uh, start a business today than it was 10 years ago. So much harder to develop it. The industrialization system works against you. The costs that come from transport system or whatever are working against you. The tax system is a disincentive. Now, there was a call the other day in Hong Kong when somebody, I was talking to somebody about setting up a business and they were wanting to make an equity investment in that business. And they said, where do you intend to locate it? Because it's a, it's a medium business in the region. And uh, I said, why? And I said, well, if you're located in Australia, you won't be. If you're located in Singapore, Hong Kong, you will That starts to you know, say to yourself, why? And uh, a lot of that's government, a lot of that's government policy. And the attitude in a place like Singapore or Hong Kong by the officials 
so fundamentally different to what it is in Australia. But I think it's our greatest danger that we are driving the business offshore because of the policies we've seen here in recent years, or we're discouraging business from coming onshore because of the policies we've seen in recent years. And that is to the long-term detriment of Australia, and it's going to see a lot of our entrepreneurial talent move offshore. One of the things you find when you walk down the streets of Singapore and Hong Kong these days is so many Australians. And it's a good thing, I'm sure, from their point of view, but wouldn't it be so much better if they were doing all that business off an Australian base? And that's really what we've done in recent years, is drive a lot of those people offshore. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Dr. John, I what it was soon after that election. All the promises that Paul Keating made about tax, for example, the tax cuts that he could deliver without a GST and uh, without an increase in tax, were soon exposed as uh, in the following budget he raised tax and took back uh, most of the planned tax cuts. And people, I don't think, ever forget that. I think uh, they were lied to once and they suspect, they'll suspect that they will be lied to next time as well. And we see this morning, even as late as this morning, you know, Ralph Willis on television talking about further increases in tax. Um, so I think that lesson is there, it's in the cycle. More broadly, I think the election is starting to be appalled by politicians who stand up and are proudly saying, I lied. You know, when Graham Richardson was treated by, uh, by the media, and this you might ask yourself about the standards of the media, as something of a hero of the things he said, or Bob Hawke was boasting that he lied, uh, I think there's something fundamentally wrong with, with our society. And people see that. I think the electorate sees that, even if the media don't. Um, we spend a lot of time teaching our kids to tell the truth. And uh, then we have role models like Richardson and Hawke for growing up. You know, we suddenly got screwed up on the way through. The other area, I think, though, is, is looking at business. I mean, business, uh, if you're in business and you lie or you misrepresent something with prospectus, even if you don't know when you do that, you can end up in jail. Surely it's about time that we put some of the politicians in jail, in, in an equivalent sense. I mean, they should be held accountable for the lies they tell. And businesses are playing with smaller amounts of savings and, and so on that others might have invested in their companies. But the government is playing with national savings and our national, our national standard of living and uh, our well-being and yet they're able to say whatever they like and then go into government and never live up to it. And, and I, I've heard so many times, thousands of times in the last year, to be honest, you shouldn't have done that, Yet they are all starting, a lot of the cab drivers I have, for example, are starting to say it's pretty, pretty sick if that's, if that's the way we're going to let this country be. So I do think there will be a way where it will change. It has to change. And um, I think the electorate will, that will manifest itself in the electorate saying, look, we want somebody who will come in and govern this country in an open and honest way. Tell us what the problems are, give us the range of options, pick an option, one is 10 why, and get on and do it. If politics has to be a business where you have to lie, then this country is not going to have much of a future, in my view. And the politicians already rank um, <coughs> below the used car salesmen in our social spectrum. And I suppose there's some used car salesmen in here. The only saving grace is that we still rank above the media. <laughs> <laughs>
Canberra being an unusual, unusual lifestyle experience compared to the rest of Australia, in the sense that uh, during the last recession, Canberra really didn't have much of a recession. And I'm sure it's very hard for people who live in that environment to fully understand the magnitude of the problems that impact on other Australians. And they don't get out to see them too often. And uh, in that sense, uh, yeah, they can easily get out of touch because of the structure. One of the proposals that we put at the time of the last election, which uh, didn't get a lot of attention, was to move some of the government departments out of Canberra. And I think particularly those who have the responsibility of dealing with business and relating to business and uh, formulating economic policy would be a better place to, out of Canberra. I used the example at the time of taking the Treasury official and letting them move out in Western Sydney and take the train every day and have, you know, have the hassle of the traffic and the inconvenience of, the, of getting about in a city like Sydney with a poorly developed infrastructure and um, start to sit on a train and really and talk to them in a real, real life sense about what was happening to their businesses and their factories and so on. And that would make a very big difference. I might also say that it would help a lot of the politicians that. Right now there's a, a focus on our party and where this party's going and what we're going to do in the course of the next five or six weeks and who's going to run, who's not going to run, and so on and so forth. Well, I think it's about time some of my colleagues in that sense went back and talked to real people too. You can go out and talk to people about what they think about the Liberal Party, and what they think about government, the processes of government and uh, where I think we should be going and what policies we should be adopting and what positions we should be leading on and so on. Uh, and I hope that sanity prevails in the course of the next four or five weeks because you can get locked up in the system down there. Um, the media incessantly focuses on personalities and, and uh, you know, focus on the atmosphere of politics, not the substance. Yet the people of Australia worry about the substance. And we might have a recovery, but they know that balance of payments is the main problem. I know that we, uh, as a nation, are living beyond our means. The interest rates are on the way up. We could face a balance of payments crisis, and that's going to have a very big impact on business. Now, the system is not focusing on that. Now, I'm sure it's a frustration to you in business that a lot of these issues don't get the attention they deserve. Uh, yet, so many trivial things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis do get a lot of attention, don't pay attention. You know, I think a lot of that points to the question is, is because of the system that breeds some of the attitudes to business. I mean, if they've never run a business, or they've never been associated with a business, it's very hard to relate to. It's very hard to think about what is required. If you're a tax official and your focus, for example, is on maximising the tax revenue of the government, you take a quite strange attitude at times towards business. Look at the FBT, the number of changes that have been made to the fringe benefits tax. Now, in principle, sure, all income has to be taxed under a system that has to raise money as fairly and as equitably as it can. But they sort of lose a sense of perspective. So they go chasing car parks and <laughs> every other damn thing. They've lost their sense of perspective. Now, sure, capital, you know, capital gains have to be taxed, because if they're not, we have a massive tax avoidance and tax evasion industry. But they look at capital gains tax system, which discourages business doesn't give you fair value for the goodwill that you bring to a business or you build in a business. It doesn't encourage you to expand the business. In fact, it discourages you. It certainly doesn't uh, encourage you to develop your business and use it as a source of retirement income. So we have a capital gains tax system that is anti-business. You know, we have a savings problem, national savings problem. So let's have it says the government, a levy, which we call the superannuation levy, you know, it's a cost on business, I understand. There are other ways of solving the saving problem without taxing business. Have a training problem, <coughs> have a training with <coughs> In fact, every time the ALP has a problem, they find a new tax to deal with it. But it's crazy, because each one of those is anti-business and discourages the one thing they're trying to, to deal with. And the revenue isn't improved. In the end, when business leaves Australia, we lose tax revenue and we lose jobs <coughs> Thank you, John. I'd like to now um, invite up Bob McDonald from the uh, editor of the Business Queensland to do the vote. Please welcome Bob. Yeah. 
respectful about politicians, but um, I'm not being political about this, but the hard working politician really does a terribly hard, onerous, and difficult job. And um, I think one of the reasons I was quite uh, delighted that the Business of Queensland could participate in uh, this function is that I think the job of newspapers, and uh, I don't think ours in particular, is to try to encourage debate in an open and honest and uh, disinterested sort of way, uh, and to try and concentrate and look at some of the more substantial issues rather than just the daily term of growing politics. And I think certainly one of the hallmarks of um, John Houston's political career has been his capacity to generate debate and to raise issues that force people to think about. And uh, he's able to force people honestly and sometimes obviously to his own detriment in a way in a political sense. But I think in terms of forcing uh, the community at large to think about these things, uh, he's done a terrific job. And uh, I don't mean that in any political sense, I'm not trying to show fear of favour, but I just think as uh, someone who is obliging people to continue debating issues, he's done a terrific job. Now, Dr. Houston, um, I've been asked to present this to you on behalf of the uh, Chamber. In the meantime, though, I'd like to wish you all the best of uh, the festive season of the new year and keep reading business queens. <laughs>